Observance Day tomorrow is a reminder of women's human rights violations and a call to action to eliminate violence against women. Over the next 16 days, the Commonwealth of Learning has arranged various activities and events to shine a light on gender inequality and gender-based violence as part of our contribution to prevent and raise awareness on this silent pandemic. Allow me therefore to welcome you to our first activity for the 16 days of activism, our webinar entitled Digital Inclusion Addressing Cyber Violence and Online Hate Against Women. Let me invite and welcome our two moderators, Dr. Mirette Newman. She is the call education specialist for the Virtual University for Small States of the Commonwealth VASC in short, and she is the person who has brought this all together. Also our second moderator, Dr. Kirk Paris, an ardent advocate for women's rights and women empowerment here at the Commonwealth of Learning. Welcome Kirk, welcome Mirette, it's over to you. Welcome everybody. Um, I believe that this is a topic to which we have not given sufficient attention. Online harassment and violence is real and it is as destructive as offline violence and it has far reaching impacts. Shame and humiliation, yes, but I think very importantly, self censorship is one of those impacts that threatens our fundamental right to freedom. And as women, we need to prepare ourselves and those we love and serve to use the tools and access the training that will keep us safe. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our featured panelists so we can get right into the subject matter. Here with us today are two wise women, Dr. Leanne Perryman, and Ms. Vilma Gregory, both of whom will share with us ideas about how we can reduce and protect ourselves from cyber violence. So from lockdown in England, our first panelist, Dr. Perryman is a senior lecturer at the Open University where she conducts research into, among other things, cyber violence. She's committed to raising awareness about the prevalence and the impact of cyber violence and the need to build digital cultures that are safe and empowering for women. She's going to talk to us about how addressing cyber violence requires a multi strategy approach involving platform change and accountability, awareness raising, education and training to support digital skills and online safety skills, and thereby reducing cyber violence. Our second feature panelist, Ms. Vilma Gregory, comes to us from Jamaica. Since the early 1980s, before computers were mainstream in Jamaica, Vilma has been passionate about all things related to online communication. She has merged her love of languages her skill with multimedia and a concern for social justice such that today she is a communications consultant and an advocate who designs and develops digital and multimedia technology tools for campaigns promoting gender equality and the prevention of sexual harassment. She has worked with several international organizations and today she will demonstrate for us how we can use digital approaches to raise awareness of cyber violence and online harassment and encourage behavior change. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Perryman who will speak with us for approximately 15 minutes and we will move straight into Vilma's presentation following that. Leanne, over to you. July, 2020, the Web Foundation who were discussing the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on women's online participation, spoke powerfully about a pandemic of online violence against women. Now, bearing in mind the catastrophic impact of the COVID pandemic, it would be tempting to feel that Web Foundation's choice of words is inappropriate. But a look at some statistics makes for chilling reading, I think, and I think justifies Web Foundation's choice of words. So looking at the statistics, 20% uh, of women in Canada uh, reported in 2018 that they'd experienced some kind of online harassment. 
15% in France, uh, in the EU 10%, and in Pakistan 40% of women reported experiencing cyber harassment since, um, since the age of 15. Now, fast forward to 2020, where due to lockdown, quarantines, and self-isolation, women are using the internet much more than before, and internet use has actually increased between 50% and 70% overall. And a report by UN Women this year reveals that ICT facilitated violence has spread on the shadow pan pandemic of violence against women. Women and girls are subject to online violence in the form of physical threats, sexual harassment, stalking, Zoom bombing, and sex trolling. So um, specific cases have been, have been documented by media and women's rights organizations of unsolicited pornographic videos displayed while women were participating in online social events, threats of violence and harmful sexist content, and as, as, as um, UN women say, Zoom bombing during video calls. So that's where um, racially charged and sexually explicit material is displayed to the unexpected um, participants. Now, um, the Indian NGO IT for Change have done some very significant work in this area. And they point to the fact that online violence against women is extending offline gender-based violence through activities including online discrimination, cyberbullying, cyberstalking, blackmail, and hate speech. And they um, explain that this cloak of online invisibility encourages patriarchal attitudes of entitlement over women, resulting in a toxic disinhibition in the online public sphere, lowering the threshold for sexist and misogynistic speech and behavior. Now, um, why does this matter? So it, it matters in a lot of, a lot of ways. Uh, online participation, as um, Merit said, it, ha it has huge potential for women. It's got the potential to increase women's capabilities through the acquisition of informational power, so access to information, memberships of information networks, communicative power, the power to open up official communication channels, to critique the status quo, um, and to shape or challenge mainstream public discourse. discourse. Also through um, associational power, so the ability to participate in community issues, participate in formal political groups, community groups, participate in collective action, and so on. Now, participation then in open online spaces offers huge potential, massive potential, but also huge threats for women. And this is particularly exclusionary in the current circumstances where so much of everyday life has moved online due to the pandemic, I think. Um, women are being denied access to online services, including education, health, and legal support due to the fear and the reality of cyber violence. And women's uh, participation as active digital citizens is also being censured. Our voices are not getting heard in many circumstances. Now, Merit also mentioned earlier the implications, the impact, and, and it's you know, hugely wide ranging. Online actions have offline consequences, and cyber violence against women is no exception, as severe psychological, social, um, health related, and mental health related effects. And the mental health consequences are, are, are terrible anxiety, stress, depression, trauma, panic attacks a loss of self-esteem and a powerlessness in um, being unable to, to respond to, to cyber violence. It's a sort of a very, very one way um, a traffic because um, the perpetrator is generally you know, so, so remote. Now, um, what can be done? So uh, Merit mentioned this, uh, you know, a multi-layer approach really. And th that is a common view that, that action needs to happen at um, multiple levels. We do need legislation change at national and international level. I mean, that, that um, advocacy can help uh, achieve that, but I think on a, on a sort of a personal individual level, that feels sort of slightly out of, out of our, our control. Um, as you know, we do need clear guidance for law enforcement officials in, in terms of how to handle cases. And I think that, that is a, a particular a problem internationally. Going down to, to women themselves, uh, we need awareness raising about what women should do if they experience cyber violence, and um, including specialist helplines. 
providing support to, to women and, and, and to girls um, in, in such circumstances. It's not obvious what, what you do. And, and platforms, um, social media platforms uh, and other platforms, don't necessarily always make it clear what, you know, what people should, should do if they encounter these situations. Um, we, and we definitely uh, need more provision for skills development in safe online participation, not only online based um, skills development, obviously, because if people are not you know, participating on, online, um, you may think that, that say free courses, MOOCs, um, other open content would be the, the way to go. But it's in those spaces that, that sometimes um, these incidents can occur. Now, education has a huge role to play, really. Um, obviously, changing attitudes and beliefs amongst the perpetrators of um, cyber violence against women is central including promoting pos positive masculinities, and, um, that, but that's not going to happen overnight, really. And as IT for Change say, these beliefs are often very deep-rooted indeed. What, what can happen, though, is um, education can support the development of communities of practice around safe online participation, and sort of communities that offer peer support and um, can point people to uh, guidance and advice as well and people can share their own their own experiences and knowledge and um research is also vital and i think that 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 may be something that sort of comes out of this in in, in the the longer term eric was talking about you know wanting this to this to continue um we definitely need more research exploring women's experiences and um also finding out what can help to mitigate against cyber violence you know, what things work um, all our efforts really do need to be evidence informed. And especially I mentioned there earlier about, about legislation and um, that you, we've got more power as in advocacy if what we're saying is evidence informed. Um, also, there, there have been some very promising technological solutions of late, but again, research is, is, is needed into their effectiveness. So one thing I just wanted to share that um, uh, we've been doing at, at the Open University, where um, I lead a postgraduate curriculum focused on online teaching. Um, we have a global student body, and we we um, we tend to use a, a curriculum infusion approach to cover the issues of cyber violence against women in our courses, um, uh, really to, ra to raise awareness, and um, we also include skills development in safe online participation, and we share resources and support the development of peer support communities. But I'm particularly interested in, in open pedagogies. And that's why I included this, this slide. Because I'm sort of interested in how they can be made safe for, for women, and indeed men, actually, who are, who are vulnerable to online, online violence. Um, so open pedagogies, that they are, are really focused on having learners having autonomy over what and how they learn, and on connecting learners with the world outside a formal course. So bridging formal and informal spaces. There's an emphasis on learners and educators co-creating and remixing and sharing open educational resources, on creating and openly sharing their assessment tasks, and also this overarching in, in, um, emphasis on social justice and educational equity and a pedagogy of care. But ironically, for women who are fearing um, open online participation, they're fearing cyber violence, then um, this emphasis on open connectedness and li linking formal education with the wider world leaves women you know, exposed to cyber violence and harassment in a way that men are not, oh, most men are not, and I don't want to, to, to generalize that much. So while open pedagogy is offered the, the potential for learner autonomy and, and empowerment and, and a reimagining of the hierarchical relationship between learner and educator as collaborators rather than teacher and taught. The threat of cyber violence and other type of online abuse uh, excludes many women from, from these affordances. And I wanted to share um, just one quote here. It was from, from one of our, our students, and, and uh, I was sort of really affected by it. The, 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 this, this student had been um, approached our, our, one of our courses really enthusiastically, was very, very enthusiastic about get, getting involved, connecting with a, you know, a, a global community and everything that 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 seemed to promise and um uh part way through the course she um hadn't been participating uh, online much and, and we had a bit of a a, a, a a skype chat 
about this and um she she took you know that's okay, okay to share what she said she said in my country many men still believe the internet is their domain and women shouldn't be participating alongside them i've taken part in open discussions before and had a terrible experience threats abuse real hatred from a standpoint of initially feeling confident and excited about making connections across the world i now feel fearful and out of my depth i'm happy to participate in closed discussion forums but feel scared about doing so more openly, especially if I'm required to show my true identity. So there, there, there there's a, a student being denied the, the potential to participate in um, open online exchanges that, that, that protest by open pedagogy because of the experience she's had with um, cyber violence. And it's difficult to, to see how this gets um, you know, turned around really. So um, I've been working with some of our uh, educators in uh, thinking about ways to, to reshape open pedagogy so that they do offer alternatives and the option to opt out. But that's sort of a work, work in process re progress really. And I think it's something that we could, as a community, work together on. So uh, what next? Um, and as Mera has, has, has said really, you know, we need to be having global conversations just like this one about this issue we need to be coming together across disciplines and across nations to to work on collective solutions that draw on our individual areas of expertise and um and also to support people who are already active in this area there's a lot of you know work going on in this area uh, i mentioned it for change there are, there are there are many organizations that we you know we need to be supporting them we need more sessions like this more research more advocacy and, and definitely more, more awareness. So that's, what, that's all, all I have um, in my the sort of formal presentation. Um, happy to, 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 to take questions or to, to um, talk about it further. Looking forward to, to um, seeing Vilma's presentation. And uh, thank you ever so much for, for listening and for, for coming today, wherever you are, and, and, and stay safe. Leanne, thank you very much for that. That has set us off very, very nicely. Vilma is now going to share with us some of the ways that she has been working to, to do exactly some of these things that we that we that that Leanne has sort of suggested and that we we touched on. I think a little bit, especially in that last poll there. Um, the the first thing is we're having this discussion one day before the twenty. I think I've blocked my own screen. Isn't that smart? Yeah, one day before the International Day, I devolve. And um, it strikes me that in many ways, I too had to look up the meaning of cyber violence, um, Leon. Um, so I really do appreciate the conceptual framework you gave. And um, it was educational for me as well. And so I just took snippets of some of the definitions and I looked through the eyes of social media at the most common hashtags, no to cyber violence, no to cyber vault, but they weren't very popular either. So this is really an embryonic stage, I think, a discussion that we can build on. And um, some of the sad reality is that there's a dark side to technology. And I looked at the causes and having done a whole campaign with UN Women and some aspects of the work I did with UNDP and UNFPA, looked a lot at the business of what causes sexual harassment, which it doesn't have to be sexual. Cyber violence comes in different ways, but the business of being rooted in dominance and power keeps recurring. And it's because it's mostly male, but from a gender sensitive point of view, it's also male, male, female, female, or female on male. So there's a whole set of intersectionalities that we can look at in terms of how we would like to visually engage persons in either a campaign or behavior change. And so I, the, the, the intersectionality of gender, race, and orient, sexual orientation and disability, I think that's pretty well known. But um, Leon, you spoke a lot to the negative impact and the psychological one, I think reverberates more than anything else. But when I looked at how, if I were to use a communicative campaign lens, to treat how I would like to engage and have behavior change with our women or men and everybody involved. I realize it has to 
focus on a multi-sectoral audience. And I took this uh, pie from the EU where we're looking at things related to, sorry, let's go back. Sorry, I think I messed up my screen. The laws, the legislation governance, which um, Leon mentioned, but the cultural norms, a lot of the things that people consider acceptable and not recognizing how offensive it is, those are the things that we have to bring in as well. And then I, I looked in the mirror. I looked at myself and said, what's my predicament? I'm, a, I'm a, an ICT practitioner, woman to boot, and there's a dark side to the very technology that I, you know, I make a living from. And then I also accept the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, that there is a lot of empowerment when women embrace technologies. But I have a dilemma in that I'm part of a, an ecosystem that also violates the very people that I stand for. So I, I try to come up with some ideas and look in the digital space for solutions to deal with a problem in the space itself. And hopefully we can work with it. And this is what I came up with. The idea, first of all, sharing the vision that we all should be happy and safe when we're online. This visual is one that I work with UNFPA for gender-based violence. But in this case, you notice the girl is happily learning how to use her tablet and the mask. And so it's a positive image of a family choosing, if you can read it says, do not make your loved ones a punching bag, you know, put your energies out there. So the business of visualizing, using images, illustrations, scenarios to share the message. And of course, with the reality is that in 2020, COVID has exacerbated uh, violence against women and girls. And then I thought of this idea as a solution. What about creating, and going back here to the, the cyber world, what about creating avatars? All these images, these faces are not real. They are created by a computer. In other words, they don't, these people do not exist, right? And these have become weapons for fake identities online. But we can use the same artificial intelligence generated images as tools and so I thought, why not come up with cyber vogue avatars? Because the normative in terms of how the we technologists react is to say, send us a report. We will notify them. We will do the report online. In the case of Twitter and Facebook, with the election, they have been tagging. So report and tag. But in a way, it lacks a lot of personalization and it lacks a lot of, um, well, it, 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 it's, it's not as impactful as it can be. So I, I'm inviting you to visualize a scenario where we create an avatar. We take one of these avatars and we give them different roles. So we're gonna use artificial intelligence now to, to, to try to sensitize persons and hopefully impact behavior change in terms of what cyber violence is. And I thought about a project I did with the Ministry of Education and UNFPA where in the health and family life education, instead of having a static web interface, website, we would create scenarios, gender, gender sensitive, mind you, the girl is making a move and the boy is making a move, <laughs> and gender sensitive scenarios where that web platform becomes a space not just for reading and absorbing, but interacting. So in this case, it's a quiz, but it could be other things. But what it means is that you're inviting engagement through visuals with the thematic areas and targeting the audience, in this case, the youth audience in the schools. Um, then, then I said we could have our advocacy avatars. We could have, um, in this case, the Prime Minister of Jamaica had made a speech about the, sex, the upcoming sexual harassment um, bill. And the, 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 the person from the ministry, Sharon Robinson, in this case, this was a video. Here, this was just a card. So we would create avatars, we would give them roles and we would popularize them and let them become um, cyber vogue, anti cyber vogue normatives and characters infiltrating the global platforms, especially at this time in COVID. And that's the vision I kept having. And I thought, is it possible? Let me share it, let me discuss it. Let me try to see. Infographics, you know, taking the statistics, there were so many that Leon shared and so many that I read about. 
But I wanted to see a little more of taking those numbers, putting with graphs. So here we would actually have our avatar. And that would be the avatar would carry our infographics and carry our advocacy along with trying to not just share the message, but inviting people to see the extent to which there is an impact that is as negative as it is. And then in this case, I won't play the audio because of time, but I have a male voice here and perhaps I'll end with it. Um, really the podcast, the audio, engaging male voices to be a part of the solution. And ending with illustrations, animations, which you animate and dramatization, always with the male presence, engaging them in the dialogue so that through the visuals here that we would have created, I'm saying, let us move from the static medium and the static response to interactive and engaging ones using visuals and the entire multimedia toolkit. And let us appropriate the avatars and the artificial intelligence, the computer generated faces into actors and social agents so that we can eventually make a change. And so that's it, stay in touch, it's a challenge, but hopefully we can get it done. Thank you very much. Just in my closing remarks, um, and I wanna thank Marit for giving me this opportunity. The, you know, overall, of course, I think we've spoken to this, but quick summaries, of course, Leanne, your presentation very much focused on um, you know, providing the background around the skills, research, open education, and certainly speaking to the mental health aspect. And I think that has become much more prominent um, in today's education circles. And I will speak to the education space uh, more so as an educationist, and most of us on the panel are educationists. <clears throat> and the mental health aspect, again, is becoming more and more prevalent. And I think the other part about that is awareness. I think there's more awareness and understanding around this space that we didn't have really only a few years ago, and of course, even further back, um, where it was attributed to um, you know, whatever the case might be, but not realizing that these are deep rooted issues that people face every day, and that it's okay to talk about this. And the fact though, however, is that it's certainly perpetuated in many respects with the onset or the ubiquity of online learning technology, um, which again, really, penetrates almost every aspect of our lives today for good or bad. I think that sort of segues to Vilma as well. Vilma, you talked about the good and bad of technology. I liked how you provided us with some ideas and tools to think about impacting or negating those aspects of cyber bullying or cyber violence. Uh, the avatar issue, which you certainly came back to is a really interesting one around this idea of kind of modeling or visualizing um, scenarios that are very real and how to address those um, in education settings and then beyond that as well, workplace, et cetera. And of course I can speak to workplace as well, um, workplace violence, gender-based violence in the workplace, cyberbullying penetrates or cyber violence, excuse me, penetrates those areas as well. And that's another hat um, that I wear in terms of corporate training in that space. Um, overall, I think the other thing we need to consider is, um, you know, who controls information? And I often think about the fangs, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Netflix, and Google. Those are all controlled by men in a very small corner of the United States. And not only they're men, they're white men. And I think that we need to see more change in that space um, in terms of who are the leaders around technology and how we can empower individuals and women in particular. Um, and I think we can't deny the, the reality of optics. Um, <clears throat> Up until just a month ago, we, we never would have thought that, you know, the, uh, the holder of the second uh, most important position in the world's most visible democracy was very much limited to white men. And that's changed. Um, the onset or the, the, the election of the Biden-Harris ticket really will enhance visibility and I think also present opportunities for women realizing that you can do this. Of course, I'm in the position of speaking as a male. So I, I mean, I certainly recognize my position of, you could say privilege, um, but I think at the same time, it's important that recognizing that men are not only part of the problem, but part of the solution. And I think as Vilma spoke to bringing men into this conversation, recognizing their role in combating cyber violence is imperative. So I think as educators, we need to consider these ideas 
and really present them to our learners, to our friends, to our family, to our, our neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, to really try to make impact and, and really change. And change is happening. So those are just some of my remarks uh, that I'd like to close out with this. And again, thinking back to our role as educators um, and how we very much are in control and have a very, very, very important influence on individuals in terms of addressing these issues around cyber violence against women. So with those final remarks, I would just like to then return to a, an offer of thanks. Uh, first off, thank you to Marit Newman, who was the facilitator of our event today. And of course, our colleague, Francis Ferreira, who started off with presenting a good overview um, about the webinar that we had. And uh, the third person, of course, is Najale. Najale and I were working on the polls. Those polls were, for, were put together by Najale and uh, her coordination was invaluable. Last but not least, of course, I want to thank both of our panelists, um, Ms. Vilma Gregory, thank you for your remarks and preparation for this. And also, of course, to Dr. Leanne Perryman.